Chapter 7 The Cryogenian and the Evolution of Animals, 850 to 635 MA. The Australian city of Adelaide is a well kept secret. Isolated on this island continent from the rest of the world, and even isolated from the rest of Australia, this coastal city has evolved its own culture artistically and scientifically. The latter has been importantly influenced by an enormous paleontological discovery made right after the end of World War II. The discovery in the arid hills inland from Adelaide of the first acknowledged larger animal fossils, the Ediacarans. Adelaide pays homage to this fossil record in many ways, including the naming of buildings and institutes for two of the scientific giants who brought clarity to the time period of a billion to six hundred million years ago. Douglas Mawson, a hardy Australian who survived harrowing Antarctic expeditions and the killing fields of World War I France, a man who also went on to discover proof of late Precambrian glaciations in Australia a concept highly doubted at the time, and Reg Sprigg, who discovered the fossils and, as we will recount, followed, like Mawson, by another geology professor at the University of Adelaide, where co-author Ward now lives and works, Martin Glasner. But new generations of workers have kept this tradition of the study of the origin of animals alive, and one of the most important is Jim Gelling of the South Australian Museum which sits next door to the University of Adelaide. Gelling has overseen a new exhibit of Ediacaran fossils in a newly refurbished, large and modern room of the museum, and there, unlike so many new museums where actual fossils are kept away from the public, substituting plaster casts or other reproductions instead, the Ediacaran exhibit that Jim Gelling oversaw has real fossils, real Ediacarans on display. The surprise is how large and complex they are, but another surprise is how they are interpreted. Until recently, the party line has long been that these were sedentary, strange, and mainly flat creatures, like stuffed pillows sitting on the seafloor, and some as large as a large, if flat, pillow. But overhead, on television screens, the animated reconstructions are anything but sedentary. Some even swim. Others move robustly. Herein lies the controversy. This view is new. But is it correct? The time interval of this chapter is the long period beginning about a billion years ago and ending with the start of the Cambrian period around 540 million years ago, M.A. In that interval, far more than great changes in life's history took place. Just as it had in the period of around 2.5 to 2.4 billion years ago, at around 717 million years ago, the Earth cooled. It cooled so much that, as it had near the end of the Archean era, the oceans began to freeze, starting at high latitudes, but continuing toward lower and lower latitudes until the entire ocean from pole to equator was ice-covered. Once again, the Earth had become a snowball. The first time, that singular event caused a great revolution in the history of life by leading to an oxygen-rich atmosphere. This second time, the Proterozoic Snowball Earth also produced momentous, if very different, effects. This time, the snowballs led to animals, but not without danger to all life on Earth. Once again, life was in the balance. The overriding question is whether the Snowball Earth episodes of this time interval were the key reasons for the sudden rise of animals, a case we will make. Life and Snowball Earth Events As we saw in an earlier chapter, the first Snowball Earth episode, beginning at about 2.35 billion years ago, seems to have been caused by life. The explosive rise of cyanobacteria caused a reduction in the greenhouse effect of the atmosphere's methane and carbon dioxide content. The start of this second and final series of snowball Earth events of Earth's long history to date occurs within the cryogenian time period described in Chapter 1. Due to recent work on calibrating the cryogenian, we know now that there were most likely two major events beginning 717 million years ago and ending 635 million years ago, 
the start of this second and final series of Snowball Earth events, is essentially in the middle of what is now formally defined as the Cryogenian period in the geological timescale. It begins prior to a pair of sharp isotope shifts slightly older than 800 million years ago, which are the result of a true polar wander oscillation. Both of the differing Snowball Earth episodes, each made up of ocean freezing and then thawing events, caused a severe decline in marine organic production, because the sea ice would block out sunlight. Thus, the amount of life on Earth, as measured by its overall mass, known as biomass, shrunk to tiny values compared to both before and after the events themselves. The succession of snowball glaciations and their ultra-greenhouse terminations during both the periods from 2.35 to 2.22 billion years ago and from 717 to 635 million years ago must have imposed a severe environmental filter on the evolution of life. The fossil record provides few clues, but the acrotarchs first described in the last chapter, planktonic organisms of small size, waxed and waned in both diversity and abundance. Many living organisms are known to respond to environmental stress by wholesale reorganization of their genomes, and any snowball earth event would have been stressful, to say the least. The developmental and evolutionary significance of such genomic changes are hot topics of research in molecular biology. The fact that diverse fossils of more complicated organisms than were there before the onset appear in the immediate aftermath of the snowball glaciations supports the notion that the snowball events created some sort of an ecological trigger for vast changes in the complexity of life and its diversity. One of the most profound of all questions relating to the snowball earth events relates to their cause. Earlier, we noted that the first Snowball Earth episode might have been triggered by life itself, the invention of oxygenic photosynthesis, which would have caused a rapid depletion of greenhouse gases. But there may have been a quite different reason for the onset of the second episodes, occurring well more than a billion years after the first. The second snowballs may have been triggered by the movement and tectonic activity of continents of the time. The so-called Neoproterozoic snowball events, the most recent of the two grand snowball Earth episodes, occurred around 40 million years after the Great Continental Amalgamation, called the Supercontinent Rodinia, an amalgamation of every continent into one continuous landmass began to disintegrate. Supercontinents tend to have arid climates because most of their land area is far from the ocean. Conversely, when continents, and especially supercontinents, separate, maritime climates displace formerly arid regions, creating the potential for increased chemical weathering. Chemical weathering of silicate rock minerals causes a rapid reduction of carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere. As CO2 drops, so too does temperature. This second time, it may not have been life so much as inorganic chemical reactions. Interestingly enough, the onset of the second snowball event, called the Sturtian after exposures in Australia, coincides rather precisely with the eruption of a massive volcanic province in Canada at 716.5 million years ago. Although some CO2 is emitted from eruption of these large igneous provinces, when they erupt on land, the drawdown of gases far exceeds the volcanic input bringing the system closer to a planet getting so white that most sunlight is reflected back into space, and that produces ever more cold. But perhaps this is not the whole story. If it could be shown that some new kind of plant life suddenly and radically increased in numbers across the globe, once again the possibility arises that the sudden reduction of carbon dioxide by photosynthesis rather than chemical weathering was involved. In fact, this may have been the case. Some of the newest of all understandings about the history of life is that land plants, still only single-celled but nevertheless potentially extending over vast areas of land, appeared around 750 million years ago. This would have done the trick. A snowball mass extinction and snowball-produced stimulus for the origin of so many kinds of animals?
What would have happened to the life on Earth of about 750 to somewhat more than 600 million years ago by the change from a world of ocean and land to one of snow, ice, and bare rock? A simple thought experiment suggests that both the abundance and the diversity of life on Earth found just before these Proterozoic-era snowball Earth events would have diminished. The life then was largely of the single-celled variety, although by this time, multicellular plants such as the common kelp and algae, green and red, that adorn so many seashores of our world would have been present too. But much of life was composed either of single-celled protozoa, all eukaryotes, or vast sheets of bacterial slicks and growths, both as near-shore stromatolites and other masses of cyanobacteria, and also huge biomasses of single-celled photosynthetic microbes in the seas. On land, we speculate that single-celled, perhaps even more complex assemblages of photosynthetic organisms, including great sheets of microbes, would have inhabited fresh water and would perhaps appear liberally on damper land surfaces. Soils, as we know them, would not have yet existed, but certainly the chemical weathering of rock surfaces, incorporating the dead and rotting bodies of what plants there were, would have added organics to the clays and sand of the surface of the land. And then onto both the surface of the sea and that of the land came ice for the former, and for a while ice and certainly cold to the latter. The extinction potential in terms of biomass is easy to imagine and fathom. Kilometer-thick ice covering the sea surface would have greatly reduced sunlight. While there is microbial life in ice, and in fact some sun does filter through sea ice, surely the biomass of plant life would have plummeted. The loss of sunlight was one part, but perhaps as significant would have been the loss of important nutrients, the all-important iron, nitrates, and phosphates of our world. As the land surface cooled and in many parts came to be covered in snow and ice, chemical weathering slowed, as did the vigor and abundance of land plants of whatever kind there were. This is, of course, hundreds of millions of years before true, complex land plants with stems and leaves. But the land would have produced far less fertilizer getting to the sea. Ocean productivity plummeted. And as it did so, surely mass extinction not only of individuals but also of whole species followed. Yet from this scenario comes a model that perhaps answers the question of why there are so many kinds of animals. Although the entire ocean surface would have frozen with pack ice, in fact, the world then had far more volcanic activity than it does now. There would have been many hot springs, geysers, and especially active volcanoes blasting heat into oceans, and in so doing producing small warm bodies of ocean water free of ice. Surrounded by icebergs and finally frozen sea, these small aquaria would have been isolated and being scattered around the world, subject to many kinds of different environmental conditions. Evolution works best on small, isolated populations. Thousands of these small marine and even freshwater refuges would have been evolutionary incubators, using the principle of genetic bottlenecks, where tiny populations, when isolated, can quickly evolve because of their small number of genes. In this way, protozoa, those small, single-celled eukaryotes, may have evolved into many different kinds of metazoans, animals. With the release of the snowball conditions, caused by the eventual buildup of greenhouse gases from all of those active volcanoes, there would have been rapid melting of the ice, as well as a rapid release of these thousands of new evolutionary experiments. Earth came out of its last snowball 635 million years ago, a place very different from the planet we know today. But forces, both evolutionary and physical, were underway that would make our late Proterozoic Earth much more Earth-like, in the sense that we know it. The oceans were teeming with life. Most were single-celled, but largely composed of the complex protozoa, such as amoeba, paramecia, and the enigmatic half-plant, half-animals, such as multicellular volvox and single-celled euglena. The shores and sea bottoms were festooned with various kinds of kelp, 
more formerly the large, multicellular red and green algae so common on Earth. Still so common on Earth. The stage was set for the evolution of the first animals. Around 635 million years ago, that process began. We think. The newly named Ediacaran period began at the end of the last snowball and ended with the appearance of creatures that were unquestionably animals. It also is the last formal time interval immediately before the start of the Paleozoic era. The time is named after its most important denizens, then the most complex organisms to have ever evolved. We call them Ediacarans. These iconic fossils of this latest Precambrian time, the last part of the Proterozoic era, reveal a wide variety of peculiar body types unlike anything alive today. Once known only from the Ediacaran hills of South Australia, there are now numerous places on Earth where these enigmatic fossils are known to be found. But the best remains the low hills north of Adelaide. The Ediacaran Hills are part of the largest mountain range in the southern part of Australia, the Flinders Ranges. Like so much of Australia away from the more verdant coast, much of the Flinders Ranges is composed of sand, rocky outcrops, and scattered vegetation adapted to a semi-arid environment. Here and there, larger trees dot the landscape, including sugar gum, cypress pine, and black oak. Year-round water holes are scarce. But when found, a rich assemblage of the iconic Australian fauna is abundant. Red and western grey kangaroos have flourished in the area since the eradication of the carnivorous dingoes, their most dangerous predator at one time. Even the once endangered yellow-footed rock wallabies can now be seen with regularity. But it is not the kangaroos and the other smaller marsupials that make this place special. It is the ancient fossil fauna. Along with the Burgess Shale of Canada, Solnhofen Limestone of Germany, and the Hell Creek Formation of North America, the Ediacaran Hills is arguably one of the four most famous fossil sites in the world. Ranging between 560 and 540 million years in age, these hills contain the record of what most paleontologists agree are the first known body fossils of animals. The discovery was made when geologist Reginald Sprigg was examining old mines in the Ediacaran Hills region of South Australia. Sprigg was a government geologist for the state of South Australia. He was walking through a desolate area countryside of eroded hills as part of his state's reassessment of the mineral resources. His job was to decide whether this particular area should have been a focus for new mining activity. However, Sprague had been an ardent amateur fossil collector during his student days and was able to recognize that the strange markings he encountered by chance within the slabs of coarse sandstones scattered across the rolling Ediacaran hills had to have been produced by some life. But what kind? Sprague was confronted with what looked like the casts and impressions of jellyfish. But he knew jellyfish are rarely, if ever, fossilized, with rarely a euphemism at best. The strata that Sprigg was looking through were extremely old, and in fact he correctly surmised that the strange fossils he collected had to have been among the oldest direct records of animal life in the world, which was his statement when he first announced the discovery a year after first finding them. Sprigg noted that the fossils appeared to represent animals of varied affinities. Soon after this first announcement, Sprigg collected more bizarre fossils, this time accompanied by Professor Douglas Mawson of the University of Adelaide and his students. In 1949, Sprigg released a full account of the discovery from a very much larger collection at the same locality, as well as the first detailed description of these curious fossils. They all came from the Pound Quartzite, a geological formation that had never had a satisfactory age determination. If Cambrian, they would be nothing of great interest. But if Proterozoic, the strange fossils would indeed be the oldest known animal remains ever found on Earth. Subsequent work indeed showed that they were older than the classical Cambrian fossils, the trilobites, that were then used to define the Cambrian, a definition that has since been revised. When examined in detail, 
These fossils are indeed different from any known living animal, and according to some scientists in the late 20th century, in fact came from animals with body plans no longer living, with no known descendants, a view first espoused by the great and sadly late Dolph Seilocker. But it was their nature as fossils that was perhaps the oddest aspect of their mystery. First of all, organisms without hard parts rarely produce fossils. When they do, it is generally only in very fine-grained rocks, such as mudstones or shale, sedimentary rocks that have been deposited on the bottoms of quiet, stagnant bodies of water. But Sprigg's clearly skeletonless creatures were preserved in sandstones, rather than in a finer-grained kind of rock. To determine whether Sprigg's fossils indeed came from the closest living match, jellyfish, sea anemone, and soft colonies of anemone-like creatures called sea pens, experiments and tests were conducted to see whether such fossilization could happen at all. One such test was conducted by Martin Glasner, Australian geologist and author of The Dawn of Animal Life, a Biohistorical Study. He describes a series of experiments using newly captured, very large jellyfish placed on thin beds of sand. He noted that the jellyfish indeed left impressions within the sand, but there's still the problem of the sand itself. Sprigg's fossils should never have been preserved. Sand grains are deposited in places with relatively high energy. Sandstones today are found near shore localities, in rivers, in sand dunes, all places where moving water can carry these fairly heavy grains. In such environments, the finer mud and clay particles are never deposited. They are just too light to settle and not be picked up again by currents, waves, or wind and carried to some other locality. Yet the Ediacaran fossils are both large and numerous and are found in such sandstone settings. To further test this dilemma, in the summer of 1987, Co-author Peter Ward invited students enrolled in an advanced paleontology class at the University of Washington's Friday Harbor Marine Labs on San Juan Island in Washington State to attempt to recreate the conditions that led to the formation of the Ediacaran fossils. Several kinds of experiments were conducted. The rich inland sea around the San Juan Islands contains a large diversity and abundance of cnidarians the phylum seemingly most similar to the apparent Ediacaran body plan. To mimic a 600-million-year-old shallow water bottom, large buckets filled with sand of various screen sizes were then covered with seawater. These experiments were similar to those earlier conducted by Martin Glasner. But in this case, the bodies used were larger, and body types other than jellyfish were studied as well. Bodies of newly dead sea pens, anemones, and some of the world's largest jellyfish were placed on the sand. More sand was then put over the top of the bodies, and then the experiments were left for a time, and after some days the top layer of sand was removed. In fact, none of these experiments left any sort of mark in the sand. The Cnidarians would rot away, leaving nothing. Finally, one student had a quite different idea. A square piece of very fine mesh nylon from a nylon stocking was placed over the top of the sandstone, and then a very large jellyfish was gently placed on top of the nylon. More fine sand was then added over the top of it all with the entire jellyfish. Sea pen and anemone sandwiches were then covered with salt water. After several weeks, when the top layer of sand and the nylon sheet were removed, the soft parts of the animal put there had already rotted away. It was discovered that just underneath the nylon stocking, there was a beautiful impression of the animal that was put there, including extremely detailed morphology that matched the underside of the animals used in these experiments. Perhaps these experiments mean nothing. But what if the world of that time were covered with something of similar thickness and material properties to nylon stockings? Properties that allowed sand grains that would otherwise be picked up by the slightest current to be held in place. We can envision a world where the shallow marine environments become covered with a thin sheet or multiple sheets of microbial life. Although fragile and easily destroyed by storms, 
These sheets would stabilize sediments and also leave soft part impressions in the sand below when animals would die, fall onto the bottom, and then be covered by more sand, which would allow for the sanitation of new beds of sand. We no longer have such marine environments today, ones that can preserve the outlines and impressions of tissue-rich but skeleton-free organisms. The evolution of mobile animals, which both tore and ate the resource-rich microbial sheets, would destroy these. Just as the stromatolites all disappeared with the evolution of animal herbivores, so too would many of the microbial mats and sheets of perhaps all of the world's shallow water environments have been eaten out of existence. The Worldwide Ediacaran Fauna Today, the Ediacaran biota is known from about 30 localities on six continents, and its fauna is classified into 70 different species, all restricted in age to the latest Neoproterozoic, although there might be a few of the species that do survive into the earliest Cambrian. The Ediacaran organisms seem to have evolved toward their full diversity in an evolutionary event called the Avalon Diversification of 575 million years ago, which would have been as much as 50 million years following the cessation of the last of the Proterozoic snowballs. From that time, they seem to have thrived, whole communities of them, in fact. Then, at about 550 to 540 million years ago, when the first evidence of animal locomotion appears in the fossil record of this age as trace fossils, activity fossils of animals including locomotion and feeding marks preserved in sediment, the Ediacarans rather suddenly disappeared. A large, diverse group of organisms disappeared just as the first animals rapidly appeared on Earth in an event known as the Cambrian Explosion. This disappearance is really the first major mass extinction marked in the fossil record, although certainly not the first mass extinction. While first thought to have been isolated on the Australian continent, it is now clear that the Ediacarans had a worldwide range. There has been no end of suggestions about how energy flowed through the Ediacarans' ecological communities. In modern ecosystems, photosynthetic plants make up the base of the food chain, and these are then grazed upon by several levels of consumers, which in turn are the prey of several levels of predators. The biomass of each of these steps is only about 10% of the trophic level below it. The Ediacarans, to some, showed a very different type of community structure. No jaws have ever been found, and no indication of predation at all. Yet the most common assignment of most of the Ediacarans is to the phylum Cnidaria, which are all predators. There have been suggestions that the Ediacarans might have contained microscopic symbiotic algae, dinoflagellates, in large numbers, just as modern corals do. But no proof of this exists. Because of the seeming lack of predators, one of the most memorable descriptions of this long-ago time was that it was the Garden of Ediacara, the last time larger life lived in a predator-free world. By 540 million years ago, this garden was gone, its serpents being a wide diversity of crawling, swimming, predaceous, and herbivorous animals. Why did it take so long for these first mobile animals to evolve on Earth? External environmental factors such as low atmospheric oxygen may have been at fault, or very high temperatures of air and sea. What we do know is that in the time between about 635 and 550 million years ago, a whole new category of organisms had evolved, ones with internal water-filled spaces that could act as an internal or hydrostatic skeleton, as well as creatures with muscles, nerves, specialized sensory cells, germ cells, connective tissue cells, and the ability to secrete precipitated skeletal hard parts. Animals or not, the Ediacarans were the first on Earth to evolve skeletons, albeit non-mineralized. Skeletons allow for the attachment of muscles, and muscles allow locomotion. Locomotion then creates other needs that continue to drive the evolution of ever more complexity. Once moving, an animal needs sensory information to find food and mates, as well as to avoid predators.
Sensory information needs a brain to process it. All of these developments were intertwined and were triumphs of the eukaryotic metazoan revolution, which is really what happened near the end of the Proterozoic. We can now hypothesize about the appearance of what we might call the stem metazoan, the single ancestor of all the complex organisms now on Earth. It would have been small, composed of relatively few cells. Internally, there would be no cell walls. It would have an epithelium sealed highly against the external environment, but here would be internal cavities filled with collagen, giving stiffness to the organism. It would also have a genetic toolbox, allowing it to increase in size and complexity. Large, ecologically specialized, sexually reproducing, multicellular eukaryotes. These were the organisms producing life's greatest adaptive radiation, resulting in the crawling, writhing, swimming, walking, and sessile animal biodiversity marking today's Earth. Numerically dominant among today's animal kingdom are animals, like us, with bilateral symmetry. In the early Cambrian, however, these were few in number, but aligned to take over the Earth. Paleoecology of the Larger Ediacarans Generally, science resolves interesting problems easily, but the nature of the Ediacarans seems to have resisted a great deal of vigorous effort. They remain mysterious. However, new work in the past few years has begun to chip away at the biggest mysteries, and some of the most important have utilized a field of paleontology that has fallen into a bit of disrespect over the past few decades a field known as paleoecology. While a brilliant driver of paleontological research from the 1960s on, it failed to yield major new generalizations and was cogently dismissed by Stephen J. Gould in one of his State of Paleontology addresses published in the last 20th century. But this old-fashioned kind of sleuthing was used in this century by Mary Droser of the University of California Riverside and Jim Gelling of the South Australian Museum to arrive at perhaps the best understanding yet about the larger Ediacarans in their world. The crux of the Gelling and Drosers and vice versa work is that we need to look at the Ediacarans in the context of their association with what must have been pervasive microbial mats lining the sea bottom. The profusion of microbial mats would have been the dominating control on the ecology and especially the sedimentology of these communities. Because there were few or no burrowing organisms compared to the sea bottoms of today, where burrowing is pervasive, the ecology of these communities would have been nothing like we know. Four kinds of animal lifestyles that associate with the microbial mats could have been present. Mat encrusters, forms that sat upon the mats and perhaps secreted digestive enzymes sufficient to dissolve the mats upon which they rested for food. Mat scratchers, forms actually and actively grazing on the mats. Mat stickers, partly emerged in the mats and growing upward as the mat level changed, because the mats would have grown upward toward the sun as stromatolites do. And under mat miners, tunneling beneath the mat. Several of these strategies also seem to have persisted into the earliest Cambrian, but by then the world was rapidly changing because of the profusion of burrowing and larger organisms, as well as active carnivores and herbivores with skeletal or hard jaw apparatuses. This very strange and weird world of organisms can also be understood only in the context of how they were preserved. One of the interesting generalizations made by specialists who study Ediacaran organisms is that the fossils are analogous to the plastered death masks of previous centuries, used by dead and dying royalty and nobility of European and other civilizations. Soon after death, the face of some then-famous person would have an impression made. The fossils we see of Ediacarans may be the same thing. Not an actual fossil from the animal, but a reproduction of the top and bottom surfaces of the creature. Making a death mask required rapid hardening of whatever material the mask was being made of, and so it is thought that the Ediacaran fossils were made of materials that hardened quickly on top of their dead bodies. The Spiny Microfossils of the Ediacaran World 
In the last chapter, we mentioned the work of Andy Knoll and his group at Harvard concerning their study not of the bigger fossils of Ediacaran age, but of the microfossils. For a billion years, single-celled life dominated the world, and what fossils they left were mainly tiny, smooth-walled globes. But as the world came out of the last of the Neoproterozoic snowball Earth episodes, the fossil record becomes filled with spiny, ornamented microfossils. This somewhat short-lived episode in the fossil record may tell us important things about the nature of the overall rise of animals to complexity. These microfossils appear no more than 600 million years ago, and then are gone about 560 million years ago, and were thus survived by another 20 million years by the larger Ediacaran macrofossils. Prior to this point, microfossils came exclusively from single-celled organisms, but these spiny microfossils may in fact be from multicellular animals. In these cases, we are seeing tiny resting stages, like cysts. There have been several important studies of these tiny fossils, including by paleontologists, developmental biologists Nick Butterfield and Kevin Peterson, who suggested that the appearance of the heavily ornamented microfossils early in the Ediacaran period was in response to small early animal carnivores, such as the earliest tiny nematodes and roundworms. The spines of the microfossils were thus defensive adaptations, serving to buttress the skeletons of these fossils, interpreted to have been single-celled. But the Knoll group suggests that the complexly ornamented microfossils are resting stages of early animals themselves. This suggests both a complex and early evolution for animals well before the larger Ediacaran fossils appeared at all. It also suggests that the early environments of animals were anything but like the Eden-like garden of Ediacara supposed by paleontologists in the late 1900s. Needing a resting cyst suggests a challenging environment of varying oxygen, including times when the water column had no oxygen at all, and possibly occasional doses of hydrogen sulfide. This view of life poses a world faced by early animal evolution that was challenging, extreme, and often poisonous. The spiny microfossils disappear around 560 million years ago, and are then replaced by what was the flowering of the large, classical Ediacaran fossils, which themselves lived as the largest creatures on Earth, until overthrown by a different set of animals at the base of the Cambrian period, slightly more than 540 million years ago. The Search for Bilaterians If the spiny microfossils are small animal resting stages rather than large protists, single-celled organisms of some kind, what kind of animals were they? About the same time that the ornamented microfossils appear in the geological record, it is supposed that another great evolutionary event took place the first animals with bilateral symmetry, something that greatly improved locomotion. The advent of a bilaterally symmetrical body plan was another great evolutionary milestone. A bilaterally symmetrical animal has a distinct front and back, with internal organs roughly symmetrical on either side of this front-to-back tube-like body. It was the kind of ancestor we would expect the diversifying animal phyla to have sprung from, but the age of these enigmatic fossils was long debated. Genetic work suggests that this ancestor should have been alive well between around 570 million and around 660 million years ago. But the fossil record has been opaque to what must surely have been a tiny, perhaps a millimeter in length, worm-like creature without a skeleton. While this is a case deserving not a little of the scorn heaped on it ever since Darwin, the fossil record should be cut some slack. The chance of a tiny, soft, worm-like creature without hard parts leaving any fossil record of itself is low indeed. Fossils from China came to the rescue. Rocks of an age considered to be the best guess of when the first bilaterian may have lived were found in China early in the 21st century. These rocks were then slowly and laboriously dated with higher precision, so that a very specific time interval, when it is thought that bilaterians must have first appeared, was identified. 
When this was completed, the search for the theorized fossils began. None of it was easy. It took three years and the completion of more than 10,000 individual thin sections, in which a hunk of rock is sliced to a very narrow width and then polished, so that light can be transmitted through it while on a microscope stage. And just such an animal was found. And it was much smaller than an eighth of an inch. Tiny fossils that were as long as a human hair is wide were found, examined, and studied. The age of these tiny wonders, named Vernanomuncula, was nearly 600 million years old. Here again is a missing link no longer missing. Small, unassuming, and true revolutionaries, these early bilaterians paved the way for what was to come, and there was more from these strata. In addition to the bilaterian fossils, the Doshanto Formation of southwest China yielded both eggs and embryos of earliest animals. It has also given us a new window into the world of 600 million years ago, and how animals changed the very nature of the sedimentological record. Prior to animals, there was no bioturbation, the disruption of newly accumulated sedimentary layers by the action of organisms. This is so pervasive today that it is hard to envision a time before it was the rule rather than the exception. Only strange environments today have this pre-animal mode of sedimentological preservation, such as the bottom of the Black Sea. There, the bottom is firm, and the sediments for the first meter below this surface show both lamination, layering, and a very low water content. Contrast this with any modern oxygenated sea bottom. The few centimeters above the bottom substrate is filled with organic goo, mucus, feces, pseudofeces, dissolved organic material, etc. Going deeper, you find a lack of lamination. All has been burrowed and consumed over and over. The slow-moving invertebrates are either feeding while moving, sediment in, sediment-rich feces out, or escaping and leaving locomotion burrows. A significant thickness of the bottom sediment has a high water content because of all the business of all the locomotor animals. As changes go, this one was huge. In the late 20th century, it was dubbed the agronomic revolution, and it is the main characteristic feature of the Proterozoic and Phanerozoic sea bottoms and the stratigraphic records they left behind. The new bilaterians were moving, and not just atop the sediment-water interface they were increasingly colonizing. A vertical component to burrowing also began. Our own take on this is that it could not have taken place without high levels of oxygen in the sea. Oxygenation is difficult at best when burrowing through sediment, and surely would have been impossible at global oxygen levels less than, let's say, 10%. The old view is that the newly evolved animals increasingly ate the stromatolites and microbial mats out of existence near the Proterozoic Cambrian boundary. The new view is that the tiny bilaterians were not just eating the nutrient-rich microbial mats. They were also making the firm substrates required for the mats to change from ubiquitous to virtually non-existent. By the latest Proterozoic time, the world was primed for animals. The genetic toolboxes necessary for the evolution of larger sizes, skeletons, and the many kinds of tissues necessary for activity were in place. Only one thing was lacking. Oxygen. After the last snowball 635 million years ago, animals were poised, but oxygen levels were too low. Yet by approximately 550 million years ago, that had changed. Oxygen levels had risen. Making oxygen levels rise permanently requires increasing the fraction of organic carbon buried in the sediments, rather than buried as limestone. Most organic carbon is sequestered by clays eroding from the continents, so any factors that increase the clay flux, particularly in the tropical oceans where productivity is highest, will notch up the atmospheric oxygen level. One suggestion is that the rise of a terrestrial biosphere of some sort may have increased the production of clays through weathering, which is certainly true after vascular land plants evolved the ability to make deeply penetrating roots. However, shifts in the position of continents relative to the equator also have a big effect, as physiochemical weathering is much higher in the warm tropics than at the cold poles.
Near the beginning of cryogenian time, but before the snowballs at about 800 million years ago, there was a stepwise change in the carbon cycle that lasted about 15 million years, during which time the fraction of organic carbon being buried dropped precipitously. This Bitter Springs event was first discovered in Central Australia and has since been found at many other sites around the globe. It presumably caused a transient drop in surface oxygen. The cause of this event was a mystery until a group led by Adam Maloof at Princeton University discovered that the onset and termination of this event coincided with a pair of very rapid, around 60-degree oscillatory shifts in Earth's rotation axis from an unpronounceable package of rock in Svalbard called the Academa Kerbin Group. This type of shift is termed a true polar wander event and involves the geologically rapid motion of the entire solid Earth right down to the liquid metal at the core mantle boundary. These particular shifts, however, moved a large chunk of the supercontinent of Rodinia off of the equator into the mid-latitudes and then back again fluctuating carbon burial and oxygen production in sync. When paleomagnetic and geochemical data from vastly different parts of the globe show the same shifts at the same time and in sync, we might learn something about how the planet works. In this case, it is oxygen. We now think that there might be as many as 30 of these TPW events during the past 3 billion years, many of which coincide with interesting events like the Cambrian explosion.